right. Welcome to the Dist Out Podcast, episode 113. 113 out here in the beautiful garage here. I'm very grateful for this week, being able to do what I want to do out here on a Friday, rapping, stitching, plugging, coming to you live wherever you're listening in, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, New Zealand, America, Canada, England. There's some listeners from Macedonia, from Europe, Alaska, Indiana. I was just speaking to a friend of mine who reckons that there's a mad population of wogs in Indiana and Chicago. 2023, see if I can go over there. 23 for Michael Jordan, I'll end up in Chicago. Dude, my favourite basketball player of all time. Of course, Michael Jordan, bro. If you were anything of a 90s kid... That Michael Jordan era was like, I suppose people had the Kobe era and the LeBron James era, but Jordan was the first of those beasts, you know what I mean? Just incredible athlete, and I love what he did. I was a massive fan. I used to go to my neighbor, some old lady called Hazel. She was uh, 117 years old. She was older than these podcasts in numbers, and she used to keep the clippings if I went away on holiday to some you know, caravan park with my parents in Nelson Bay and get cheated on by that girl, Rachel, Q Rachel, um, you know, I would come back home and she would have clipped out any pictures of Michael Jordan. If it was playoff time, even during the year, like the Daily Telegraph at the back, she was a right-wing Christian Nazi. No, I'm joking. All right, Hazel, love you, rest in peace. Um, she used to read the paper and then say, oh, hello, there's that, that uh, African-American basketball player, uh, Michael Jordan. I'll clip that out for Vlad. He will love that. <sighs> I might as well have another custard tart. And she would clip it, and then I'd go and pick it up, and she would, she would say, oh, Vlad, Vlad, I've got something for you, darling. Lovely lady, man, lovely. Where do you see these? Where do you find these people now? Not in my area. The last time I had an altercation with an old witch like that, she tried to take my fence line. Pitch come on, it in. Now it's, uh, it, I don't know, back in those, I don't know if people were nicer. Probably not, you know, probably not, whatever. Uh, it's all circumstantial. It's circumstantial, and I can be there with you. <gasps> I think that's a lyric from a song, Alanis Morissette or something. Yeah, so she used to cut it out. Michael Jordan, 2023, Chicago, brought her back. Rabbit hole, classic Vlad. You know how it goes, bang, bang. All right, clip that. So that's what it is. This week and last week, I would say, has been a challenging week for me. Pfft, might be mentally, psychologically, uh, my thought process. You know, you, you, can't stay on, you can't stay on point 100% of the time. You're going to fall off, bro. And this is for the people that are listening to, to the This That Podcast. There's thousands of you listening now. So it's like, I, I understand if I'm feeling it, everyone's going to be feeling it. And um, take a note out of my book, take a leaf out of my book or whatever they call it, a page, a leaf, a branch or something off my tree. The, the thing is, you got, it's not an easy out. And it's like that guy... Winston Churchill said, I think if you're going through hell, just keep going. And the last two weeks has felt like a bit of a hell for me mentally. I don't understand why. I've been off the booze now for um, f- 40 days. So call it six weeks um, off the booze. Again, I'll reaffirm here that I wasn't like an alcoholic, but I would say I was a regular drinker on a very low level like i would crunch the two drinks at night time whilst cooking i love that that was my favorite thing come home play with the kids get in the kitchen whip together a meal i like cooking that's just who i am bro i'm like gordon ramsky i'd get in there to whip up a meal during that hour of the cutting the prepping the cooking the wrapping the stitching the plugging i'd be cranking i'd be crunching little craft beer or get my bottle of whiskey or something like that. It's a ritual, bro. And rituals, I'm telling you, uh, if you replace one, if you take one ritual, you got to kind of replace it. Uh, if you go straight into the darkness with having no substitute, it's very easy to slap back. That's just my experience. Now, I don't know the heroes that go to rehab and stuff like what they say, but all I'm saying is like, I changed the beer, the craft beer, to like a San Pellegrino, Essenza, San Pellegrino. Send me some boxes, bro. I bought this from Harris Farm. So I'll swap it. Come to the time for the beer, rip into that. Have a, non, have a non-alcoholic beer. I've smashed like 16 non-alcoholic beers in the last two weeks. 
I actually don't mind the non-alcoholic beers. I'm meeting up with the boys tonight. It's going to be like, well, they're going to drink. I know that for sure because we're going to have some pizzas and some drinks. And I'm going to bring a four-pack of non-alcoholic beers. And I reckon that'll tie me through. For sure it will. I'm not going back to, to regular alcohol drinking. I don't even know if I'm going to go back at all. Like if I've come this far, 40 days... It's like Jesus when he went into the desert. You got 40 days, 40 nights. He understood that it takes about that much time to look introspectively at what's going on. Now, the last week or two has been challenging in the sense that I'm overwhelmed with a million things that need to be done around the house, with the kids, with the missus, with the property, with this, with next year, looking at touring internationally, and putting together a big show and when it's all clumped on you don't have that exit valve like a uh, escape route let's call it of like just drinking because drinking is like a, it's a number it's a it uh, what's it called when you when you take away like your disinhibitor it's a disinhibition station takes away that prefrontal cortex what numbs it or some shit like that it's like yeah i don't want to i don't want to jump in the cold water three drinks later you can jump into a cold water i don't want to you know go skydiving if you have five shots of rakia you'll skydive it'll disinhibit you to do stupid shit or speak to someone that's getting married you'll go up and try to tune a girl that's walking to down the altar if you've had enough drinks so i i think because the lack of that i've just been stuck with just working out how to deal with like a lot of shit there's a lot of stuff going on that i'm not going to talk about publicly i'm not stupid and and then just do it naturally you know and then you can't just go and lick a river because the kids my son's got the cold or my daughter's complaining or something or my missus got to go stitch she's got to go to work the house needs to be painted you you just got to head down ass up and go straight into the fray like that's just what it is and that's why I know a lot of these wogs, they're punching alcohol from first thing in the morning, these guys. And you go to them, geez, they're hard people, man. They've just got through hard. I'm seeing drinking two litres of, of pure, like, ethanol every week. Of course, he can get through shit. He's, can he get through shit, like, clear-minded, lucid, sober? It's not easy. I'm not judging, though. I'm just saying that from two sides of the same coin i'm looking at it i've been on one side i've been i'm going on the other and i've been sober many times in my life of course as i said to before it was just a light ritual but it was happening quite a bit so it's like you're slipping and it was the COVID times prior to the COVID times it wasn't as pertinent it wasn't as regular because it, life was different two three years ago bro the, at the moment life's kind of uh, it's tougher at the moment. Like, I'm not just, I'm not going to get too negative on it, but it is just, it's a little bit tougher. Like, we're trying to get society back in order from every industry, from inflation, from, you know, trying to lend money and build and builders and tradies. It's catastrophic at the moment. Let's be honest. So, everything's, and I think everyone's feeling the pinch and stuff like that. So, for me, it was been like last week. Ten a little bit on the challenge side and he's i think you bro like Kitas, anthony Kitas from the red hot chili peppers i watched the uh, road jogan he interviewed him the other day and like my mate sent it to me he goes bro anthony Kitas, i like the red hot chili peppers like from probably since 1993 when they came out with blood sugar sex magic when they dropped that song suck my kiss i love that song and give it away give it away give it away now uh, I loved them and I fell in love because they they molded, they fused melting pot this that of like hip hop and punk rock, rock funk, this kind of shit. And that's when I was like, I've got to play guitar. Like at that point, I have to play guitar because Frushante's licks and stuff, I loved them. And then it was like the glory times of the 90s, Nirvana came out, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, all the pop bands, all that kind of dingy drugo scene that came out. I was totally into it. And then hip hop, also came out ice cube iced tea all these other drinks they came out at the same time but i love Kitas how he was rapping i was watching him on road jogan and getting interviewed and stuff and he's like this bloke's worth a hundred million dollars and his life is like has been tough in many ways as well like he's the type of guy that goes to alaska to go fishing with grizzly bears because he can do that and sail around on boats and stuff in Kuwait, looking at constellations in the stars 
he can do that stuff and then goes to Austria and plays out a stadium of 20,000 people. His life is incredible like that. But it, also, he was in, the, like in some back lane trying to score heroin so he can fall asleep under a couch. It's like swings and roundabouts. There's a lot of different pros and cons for his life, you know. But his, mate, his life, from what I could see, he was very calm, same centred, stupid moustache. Like, my moustache, it's like if I took this art line at Texta and I just... Just coloured that shit in as black as possible. You know, you're 60 years old, Kitas. There's no chance that that is that black. And his hair is as black as, as all evil. I don't know. It was as black as the inside of someone's bowels at night time. It's very dark. And he, he, that looks like... How does that stay that dark? Like, I've got mates now with dark hair that have already got a few silver, you know, spots coming over, light dusting. How does this guy at 60s? Oh, he's been boot polishing the shit out of it, that's for sure. Anyway, that's beside the point. So he's got a life of passion, this guy. The, the inspiring thing about it, which, I've, which I like Ketis about, and I've read his book and I listen to all the albums, the newer shit, yeah, I mean, it's maybe 20% decent songs, the rest is just, for me, just filler. Because the inspiration goes down, bro. It's like you've got 50 million bucks or 100 million bucks. Now you're doing it just for the fun. You're enjoying it. You love it. But you're not digging as deep as you used to, you know. You dig really deep when you're a desperate druggo and you don't know, how, you don't know whether you're going to pop off. That's where you dig the hardest. And you write the best shit then and then you can release it slowly, slowly down. And that goes for comedy. That goes for everything. Maybe not comedy so much because... Actually, to be honest, comedy should get better because life doesn't get easier as you get older. There's more challenges and you can observe a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then you can make comedy. The, yesterday, I went to the ENT, is an ear, nose and throat hero. Um, 100% driven up in some type of Mercedes that's over $200,000. Um, nice guy, Aussie bloke um, with a German last name or something, but it looks Aussie. Calls me in, Vlad, how you going, mate? How you going, man? Oh, yes, I've seen your scans, okay, okay. And uh, this kind of a chat, you know, you're going, I go, where would you like me to sit, like on the leather chair? He goes, no, that's my chair. Uh, just just get you down on one of these these little schoolboy chairs, if you don't mind, Vlad, okay. So I've noticed over here in your sinus, you've had some years of sinusitis. I'm not going to ask how, uh, but uh, that seems to be infecting uh, your, your vocals and, and things. I was like, yeah, bro, to be honest, for six weeks... I had the voice of a death metal singer after a you know concert, a big day out. And now, interestingly enough, about three days ago, four days ago, I got my voice back to 100% and now I'm about to dump a small fortune on you. You know, and he goes, oh, that's okay, we'll see, we'll have a look inside. You know, sometimes you, you, we might find something. I don't say that, that you're finding nothing, everything's fine, right? And he goes, oh, it should be fine, sounds good, sounds good. And he goes, I'm just going to spray a little bit of like a, uh, a numbing agent up your nose and uh, then we'll have a look. And once we have a look, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be able to discern what the issue is. I go, ah, it's dripped down. It dripped down my face and went onto my lip. Lips gone. 15 seconds later, I can't feel my lips. Face is numb, head's numb, all the sinus passages numb. And he's chatting to me, this bloke. So what do you do for work? What do you do for this? What do you do for that? I was starting to have a chat to him. He goes, all right, now I'm going to get a camera uh, and it's going to get some string like this. Gets a little string and he wants to put that straight up the nose, right? And he puts some sunglasses like these on and the strings are attached to them. And he starts feeding this string up my schnoz. And I got him, you could put a fucking McDonald's straw up there. It's big enough. This is a tiny little string. I shouldn't feel anything. He goes, no, you should be fine. Just lean your head back. Now, I'm going to project it on the big TV over there. You'd be able to see exactly what's happening in your nose. I go, turn the TV off, bro. I don't need to see that much. Why am I looking into my nose cavity? Just say good or shit operation or get out of here. Like, I don't need to know the ins and outs, the literal ins and outs of my schnoz. Uh, Please, it's too much for, for your regular layman like me. He goes, that's okay, switches the TV off. And he goes, you're going to feel a slight tickle. You're going to feel a slight... I go, what are you doing? He goes, shh. Okay, five, four, three, two, and... There you go. I go, 
bro, that, that sucked. That, I didn't like the feeling of that at all. And he goes, and now the left nostril. Okay, as we're going in there, oh, it's a bit of a narrower passage there. Looks like you have a deviated septum. I go, oh, and he goes, just hold it up now. Uh, 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 puts it in there. Then 10, 9. This guy's counting to me like it's fucking Sesame Street out here. I go, bro, stop it with the talking. Just just say, just a second. Okay. And nearly done. Done. This guy's counting. I'm counting with him. He got to six. I'm like, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pulls it out. So I go, what's it look? He goes, all good. Everything looks fine to me. Um, yes, you do have some thickening mucosal um, membranes in there, insane in the mucosal membrane. And he goes, we're going to, it's okay. We'll just have you on some sprays every now and then and make sure that you're keeping up with sinus flushing, going, licking rivers, getting in the salt water, staying in the nature. I go, I've been doing Wim Hof and having cold showers every single morning like a person that doesn't pay his gas bill. Is that good? Is that beneficial? He goes, oh, you know, look, I don't get onto pop culture fads. I am just do deal with science. And I said, okay, well, you don't believe in Wim Hof, a bearded Norwegian guy that hangs around in baths and stuff? He goes, well, you know, he can do what he wants to make his own crumb, but now I'm going to smack you in the head with a $500 fee for 30 minutes. And I go, all right, cool. No problem. You've got probably 15 other people like me coming up. He goes, that's right, that's right. There's five to 10 grand a day. I go, oh, oh, good. Science is a good cash grab there, bro. So he goes, I go, what about the throat? Did you see the throat? He goes, yeah, throat's fine. And I go, but is it working like? Is there? He goes, there's no polyps, there's no nodules or any dots or bumps or like, uh, you know, cysts. And I was like, thank the good Lord above because this is, this is my tool, what I'm using right now. I can't be coming in going, oh, you're going, blood, what's going on? You know what I mean? It's not going to work. So he goes, all right. And I go, but did you check it? Is it? Because the voice looks like a vag a little bit. It's like two flaps that come together. Being politically correct and stuff, flap is a good word for it. I think they actually use flap. So the voice, if you look on the camera, is just like that. It's just... It's a flap, right? Now, I don't know who's dirty, who came up with that, but you got two vocal folds, they call it, sorry. They call it folds. I take that back, it's a fold. It's not a flap, it's a fold. So... I go, he goes, oh, I can have another look again. I go, why didn't you look at it in the first place? He goes, I did look at it, man. And I go, yeah, but I didn't even move the voice. It was just lane dormant. I need it to be stimulation station. I need to be singing, something like that. He goes, all right, I'll do it again, bro. Lean back, relax. Do you want to watch it on the TV? I go, enough of the TV, bro. Enough of the TV. All right, so fucking Harvey Norman in here. And he goes, all right. So he puts that thing up again. And this time, this is like Jenna Jamison porno in 1998. This guy is feeding this tube into my nose. I'm literally start gagging. I'm like, uh, uh, and he goes, hold it there. I go, uh, just a little bit longer. He goes, big deep breath in your nose. And, I go, uh, and he goes, all right, now sing something. I go, sesame stray, and he goes, breathe in again. I can feel this thing straight at the back of my throat. It's right down there. He's got a little camera. He's looking around like Inspector Morse in there. And he goes, keep singing a far away, keeping up far away, whatever the lyrics of sesame stray. And then he goes, okay, pulls it out. You're all good, man. You're all good. All right, so I read a little thing today that I thought is interesting. Uh, I bought a book, got delivered to my house. Tell me what you guys think, and girls. Once an individual search for a meaning is successful, it not only renders him happy, but also gives him the capabilities to cope with suffering. Now, this is him, all right? So it could be she, or they, them, or this, that. So you throw your gender pronouns in there. And what happens if one's groping for a meaning has been in vain? What happens, bro? You tell me. This may well result in a fatal condition. <sighs> Tough. Let us recall, for instance, what sometimes happened in extreme situations, such as a prisoner of war camp. All right? So this is real life stuff. 
in the first, as I was told by American soldiers, a behaviour pattern called the give up itis. In the concentration camps, this behaviour was paralleled by those who one morning at 5am refused to get up and to go to work and instead stayed in the hut on the wet urine and feces. Nothing, neither warnings nor threats could induce them to change their mind. And then something typical occurred. They pull out a durry, a cigarette, from deep down in a pocket where they're hiding it and they'd start punching the durry. They'd smoke the cigarette. At that moment... We knew that the next 48 hours would, we would be watching them die. Meaning orientation had subsided and consequently the seeking of immediate pleasure had taken over. All right. Is this not reminiscent of another parallel? A parallel that confronts us day by day. I think of those youngsters who on a worldwide scale refer to themselves as the no future generation. To be sure... It is not just a cigarette to which they resort to, it's also drugs. In fact, the drug scene is one aspect of a more general mass phenomenon, namely the feeling of meaninglessness resulting from a frustration of our existential needs which in turn have become a universal phenomenon in, in our industrial societies, which is currently what we're living in, obviously. Today, it's not only logotherapists who claim that the feeling of meaninglessness plays an ever-increasing role in the etiology of neuroses. As David D. Yalom Shalom, your wise, said in Existential Psychotherapy, of 40 consecutive patients applying for therapy as a psychiatric outpatient, 30% had some major problem involving meaning. Thousands of miles east of Palo Alto, the situation differs by only 1%. So in a different country, I'm, I suppose they're speaking about. The most recent pertinent stats indicate that in Vienna, which is in Italy, if you've ever been there. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, that's Venice. Uh, Vienna, wherever it is, Austria. Australia, 29% of the population complain that meaning is missing from their lives. All right, listen. 50 years ago, I, pl I published a study devoted to a specific type of depression I had diagnosed in cases of young patients suffering from what I called unemployment neuroses. And I could show that to the neuroses really originated in a twofold identification. Being jobless was equated with being useless and being useless was equated with having a meaningless life. Consequently, whenever I succeeded in persuading the patients to volunteer in organisations, adult education, public libraries and in the like, in other words, as soon as they, they could fill their abundant free time with some sort of unpaid but meaningful activity, their depression disappeared altogether, although economic situation had not changed and their hunger was the same. The truth is that the man does not live by welfare alone. As Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. Along with unemployment neurosis, which is triggered by an individual's socioeconomical... So anyway, this is the book. So I can zoom in on that. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. This was written by Dr. Viktor Frankl in Nazi Germany time. So we're in 2022, then that's 80 years ago, and same shit is happening now. Um, so this guy was onto it from a long time ago. Industrialization has given people a lot of reason to feel morbid and to go out and do lines off the back of an iPhone 14 in the toilet. It is what it is. I'm just uh, reporting on the factualities of life, bro. And, um, you know, I've been there. I've seen it. I've uh, been part of that catastrophic lifestyle. Uh, it is something that we need. Meaning is something that is missing from... A lot of people's lives, a lot of people's lives. People inbox me all the time about things, and I'm never going to mention them because, you know, I'm like Darth Doctor, uh, where the Doctor and Vlad confidentiality. Sorry, it's the, it's the Vladiator Vlad confidentiality agreement that we've got going on here. All right, so let's maybe crank on to a couple of questions here. What have we got here? On that South of Mount Clinic. Questions for Vlad. This that podcast. I gotta turn this off because I have no reception in this garage here whatsoever. All right, one second. What have we got today, bro? I haven't even looked at them yet. Oh, there's a few here.
All right, I'll try this one. T. Cobby, what's the best financial advice you've been given? I have to dig in for this. I haven't even thought about that. I've had some stupid financial advice. Like, I've had... I've had so much life advice given. I'm the type of guy that listens and, and it sticks in me. I like I, I love listening to that shit. It could come from the least likely person, bro. It could come from a home, homeless person I'm just having a chat with while I was punching a durry at the front of a club. And I and if he said something that, you know, that sounded profound, I'd be like, far out, bro. I was incredible. I'll write it down in the in the notes or something like that, or just throw it in my head and try to remember it after a, uh, you know, a barrage of Heineken's got thrown down the, the throat. But the best financial advice I've been given is probably from my dad, who's been able to maintain some financial stability his entire life, which was just buy property, get into property. That's where the real estate rap came from. He, he hated when I was spending cash on, he used to call it glossy magazines. Once I was in the toilet reading like a skateboard magazine or something like that, and there was like 40 of them in this, in this like, kind of a basket a woven basket i used to love it i would sit down to drop a grogan and i would open up the scabble magazine and i'll go through it brought me a lot of pleasure this guy is like you're wasting your money this is some dumb shit and i can understand where he's coming from he came from the 50s bro the 60s they're, they're not glossy magazines that's what are you talking about he was like trying to wipe off a lepeshka from the bottom of his shoe like from a from a cow shit and and try to go and, and take some peach off the trees before the bats get it at night time so he can him and his brothers and sisters can eat that didn't come from let's have a look at someone he'll flip over a park bench it, it just didn't work like he was looking at the necessities of life back in the day and what you what you start with is it holds you the first 10 to 15 years it holds you a lot like you can learn a lot of life some uh well, I, I don't know, kind of, it's the foundation, I think, you know what I mean? It's very hard, you can go get swayed totally the other way, but well, in my circumstance, in my situation, what I've seen from people, they'd stay like that, you know what I mean? So what they're exposed to. And he doesn't spend dumb shit like that. He would buy books, my old man and all of that, but he likes he properties, what he always told me. So when I was 20 or 21 or 20, I bought a property. So I was like, he locked me in on that. He did, for any of the younger gladiators listening, he locked me in on a property, Harvey's with someone, and he guaranteed, he became the guarantor of the loan. So it was like, I had to pay it. It was direct debit out of my bank account every month. So I had to pay, I had to work, make sure I paid. When I was unemployed in the catastrophe years, jumping between jobs and all that, 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 that doesn't stop. That just keeps coming out of your bank account. And that's how you can go under really quick and have 300 bucks for the month to spend. And I've done that so many times, just had literally 300 bucks for an entire month. Uh, one, you get paid say three grand or four grand for the month and then gone, 800 bucks left in your bank account. By the time you pay for a few petrol and some meals, you got 300 bucks to live on for the rest of the month and it's the 10th. It, it, it happened more years than, than not, let's just put it that. That way, the balance of me being able to get on top of financial issues is not, it's, it's way less than I've had issues with finances. Because, but I've cranked myself in the real estate world. So, real estate was good for many years. I hope it's going to be good because Australia is a good country. Like, you, you know, it's not like I'm investing in, in some place that's horrible. So, it's like it's a good country. Hopefully, what I've invested in one day will pay off. But it has come. Like, things have gone up from when I was 20 till now. Things have doubled, tripled, whatever. So, it goes up and it's like money for old rope. You're paying off the original debt, but it's going up in capital. So that was probably the best advice. Another guy gave me some advice that used to work with us and he was like, get yourself in a load of debt if you wanna get yourself into a, a, into a place of discipline, get yourself into a load of debt. That was his advice, worst advice I've ever had. All right, uh, this guy was as stressed as it gets, like the definition of stress, if you open up the dictionary, is his head there like that. No, not like that, like this. His head was there just freaking out. This guy had four credit cards. You got AMP, ANZ, and Commonwealth Bank all having meetings at a restaurant talking about how to get the money back from this guy. And he's just tapping left, right, and center, center at Balenciaga and Prada trying to buy new slides. It, it, was, it was not good advice. So I've seen the point. He's got a point. 
get yourself in debt and then you've got nowhere to run and you, you, you're you going to come to work and all of that shit. But, I mean, philosophy's changed. This was like the 2000s. That's, that was some, that was, he gave me a good point. Like, but I'm young, bro. I'm 20 years old. So who could be bothered, like, at that point? You're just like, who gives a shit? Like, I want to go for a surf. I want to take the missus out. I want to find the missus. I'm trying to match this fake Versace shirt to a pair of fake Gucci pants. It's it's just you got different priorities then. So you can't force life either. Is you're 20 years old, your head's not into building, uh, you know, a portfolio. It, it just isn't. Most people it isn't. Some it is, bro. Maybe that guy Warren Buffet. It was for him, you know. But he's an outlier. He's a weirdo. Your your regular Tom chair, Dim chair, Yov chair, Blago chair, Board chair. They may be thinking about you know what type of shoe can I get this weekend to impress the girls that don't even look at it. You're just impressing your mates, which is a little bit gay, but you know what I mean? It is what it is. And uh, this this guy was like, do that. So I did it. I got a credit card and I got myself 13 grand into debt and it took me six years to pay off. Shittest thing ever because the, the, the fucking interest rate on this credit card was like 12, 13% or something like that. By the time I worked it out, I paid 10 grand back. So it's not worth it. And I remember I came into a stack of cash at one point from rapping when I got serious and I just like cut up the card and I remember talking to the girl from, I bought a laptop, it was like 2012 or 13, my laptop fried, I went and bought a laptop, no it wasn't that, it was before that, I bought something for like three or four grand and she goes, would you like to keep the credit card open? And I go, what's the, what's like my limit? She goes, five grand? And there's no interest for the first 60 days. And just make sure you pay your debt in that 60 days. I go, yeah, sounds fair, bro. That sounds fair. I'm texting my mates about which pub to go to. Like, I'm not even paying attention to what she's saying. I'm texting and driving while speaking to a Filipino lady. And she's going, yeah, that's fine. And we can stretch that up to 10 grand if you like. I go, of course you can. Of course you can stretch it up to 10 grand. You want to come and do the work? You want to door knock with me and speak to, to Stella? Stella and Con Costanopoulos? Down the road, who doesn't want to sell, they thinks that their house is on a, in a bun, on an oil mine and wants $1 million extra than what it's worth. Do you want to do that in order to pay this shitbox back? She's like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. It's not okay, bro. Just leave it at five grand. Lo and behold, you get the app on the phone, crank. Once it gets to five, oh, I want to go on, a, I want to buy some new skis or I need to buy new car wheels or put an exhaust pipe. Bang, crank it to eight, crank it to 10, crank it to 12, crank it to 13, gone. 13 grand, bro, on a credit card is a lot of dough when you're young. All right, if you're making big dough, you can wrap, stitch and plug as enough. You can make 130 grand on anything. But if, it's, if you're making 60 grand a year and your credit card's 13 grand plus your living expenses, I mean, catastrophe is coming up. It's you pretty premeditated. I don't know how I got to. This is the question. Sorry, bro. Who am I speaking to here? T Lobby, T Cobby. <clears throat> so my best advice is, bro. I got this is the best advice. Spend. Sorry, save ten percent of everything you make straight away. Take 10%, this is if you don't have a family and kids and stuff like that, but the 10% should be in a, in a different account called For Me. Now, once you get a missus, once you get an offset account that offsets your mortgage, you put all your dough in that offset to offset these heathens' tax, uh, the percentage, interest rates, all right? Because they could be charging you now 5% on a $1 million loan. It's 50 grand a year. Work that out. Um, if you've got $2 million, it's 100 cakes a year. Excuse me, Jesus Christ. Shout out to Remedy, by the way. They've sent me these things. I've become an official influencer now, and people are sending me stuff for free. I feel very, um, very uh, blessed. I'm very, hashtag gratitude, man. Thank you for sending me the cans. Um, so I put 10% away in the For Me account. That helped me. I got into a slight discipline like that until I got my recent home and now I've put just throw everything in the offset account. But the 10% is good. No matter, you make 80 grand a year, that's 8K. Five years later, it's 40K. You think what's 40K? It's, trust me, it's just what makes you sleep at night. And it's in 10 years, it's, four, it's, it's 80K. And if you're in, it goes up and compounds and, and you're making more dough, it gets to 150K. In 10 years time, if you sat there and you go, bro, life's hard at the moment, you look at an account, it says $157,500. dollars 
you're going to be way more at risk than if you look at the account and the, the Filipino lady is calling you for 13 grand and you've seen a collection of Balenciagas that are scuffed, dirty, they've got someone's spew on the bottom of them, you're going to hate yourself. So it is what it is. And, I mean, this is not unsolicited life advice, bro. T. Cobby is asking me this question. So if you're going to cut that, speak to T. Cobby. He wants to know. Yeah, otherwise... Do as you will. I'm not like some financial expert at all. I live a quite of a m- normal life, bro. I've got what I want, and, and that's what it is. You know, I'm not trying to grab God by the balls. I told you that last week. I don't want to drive around in Bugattis like Andrew Tate. It, that's Look, even if I had 50 mil in the bank account, uh, I'm not going to get 28 sports cars. It, I'm just going to kick back. Uh, my, it's going to be an Audi. It's going to be the top of the line Audi, and that's it. One car. Who knows? That being said, it might be a Porsche 911 Turbo S. Who knows? You know what I mean? Might be one for my dad. Might be one for my mum. Might be one for the missus, proprietary limited. Who knows? You know, I can turn into a hypocrite dumb quick when a lot of money comes in. Like ever, money changes people. So that's probably the best financial advice, bro. Save 10%, get some type of property, and uh, don't listen to people that say get yourself into a, a lot of stupid debt for no reason just so you can go to a job that you don't like. All right? Wrap. All right, 85RH, questions for Vlad. Uh, Leb Greek christening at a Maronite church, how much of a donation station should I give the priest as godfather? Uh, how much of a donation? But what's a Maronite church? What is that? It's like, is that a Catholic thing? Maronite church. Maronite church. Christian ethno religious group native to Levant, Levant region of the Middle East. All right. I don't know, bro. Cash him up. Slap him. Slap the cash all over this priest, bro. You love it. You love it. The priests love a little bit of cash. Help the church going. Buy some new ikoni. Throw up a new painting of the gospel. You, you, you give what you want, bro. There's no rule. I know that sometimes when I go to church, like you. I give my daughter a couple of bucks, my son a couple of bucks to chuck it in that that little like suede bag. They come out with a little suede bag. Hello, would you like to give donations? And you just throw it in, you know. And I see some people like pull out, you know, hundred bucks, and they'll they'll hold the hundred. But I've seen the I've seen some heroes hold the hunch, and and look around like they're they're acting like yeah it's small change bro you know it's just for small change coming here to cleanse myself throw a hundred in there good on you donation is good that's fine you know but we know what you're doing as well you know if you're gonna give a hundred scrunch the hand hundred gets scrunched you throw the hand in you release you let it go you don't go you don't flex in church you don't come to church with a huge shirt that says Versace culture Jeans Kucha. You don't do that. You just dumb it down. It's a little white shirt. It's a little jacket. It's a little pair of suit pants. It's a little pair of lace-up shoes. It's very minimal. It's simple. You're there for the right reasons. It's not a flex station, dude. You can do that when you get to your Bond nightclub in Melbourne. You don't do that when you go to church and there's a guy that's dedicated his life to a book out there he's screaming in a cloak. And you're, you're coming in with 38 grand worth of clothing on. Uh, I don't understand that. Anyway, do what you want. Who cares? You know I mean, except all in the church. That's what it is. Just my my perception of things. You scrunch the hunch. That's what it is. Scrunch a hunch, drop it in there. That's the way I'd be doing. Scrunching the hunch. But if I was going to give this priest, grease him up, bro. Grease him up. You've only been a godfather probably once in your life. I don't know. Some people, there's people out there that get caught called to be the godfather a lot and it's the most it's the best time to act like michael corleone from the godfather it's the best time when you walk in you're holding the child at the christening you're doing the swap overs of the helmets of the crowns in the church you're signing autographs on the marriage certificate if something happens to you you've got custody of the child you gotta look them up you gotta you grow them up sorry look after them see i've used those two words accidentally There's a lot of responsibility to come with the Godfather. So at the same time, cash. You throw the cash at them. You know, I'm responsible, but also grease you up like a mechanic here. That's what I would do. Just grease them up. Little envelope, maybe, you know what I mean? A few grand in there. Throw it at them. 
make people think that, you know, if they need a loan, they see you, not the Filipino lady from AMP. All right. So, I don't know. That's that's a pretty simple kind of question, bro. I might I might I might leave it at that. Cash it up, wrap it up. All right, let's keep going. I got a tennis match coming out, gotta destroy my mate. Khaki S2 does. What the fuck is that handle, bro? Khaki S2 does. How can I find a nice wog guy to bring home to the family? How can I find a nice wog guy to bring home to the family? That's the question. Bro, there's there's very nice guys around. There's there's top blokes are plenty. It's um it's it's actually not as hard as you think, bro. You just gotta open up your perception and be willing to work. That's 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 the thing that I'm I'm noticing. People from and I'm probably wrong, but this is gonna be my stab in the dark of a nightclub. It's chicks have said to me, I can't find a bloke. I just can't find a bloke. And then blokes have said to me, bro, where do I find a girl? Like, where do I have to look to find the missus? I want to – these guys are in their 20s, bro. Like, we had no problem looking for missus back then. I remember, like, in the 2000s, when I was looking for a missus, there was plenty of chicks around. It was just more like, am I attracted to you? And can she handle my head? A head that a mother can only love. Uh, but it's more like these days, people are more single, less boyfriends uh, in their twenties. In their twenties, it's just like forget about it. And I blame this shit, dude. The phones are fucking catastrophe. It, it's too much. Apps have done ya. Apps have cooked ya. Apps have fried ya. You're gone. This generation is gonna find that really. I'm not. I'm not capping it to say, oh, you're never gonna find. You might find someone down the line, but it's gonna come at a cost, bro. The, the thing is this, there's too much information, and too much stimulation, and people aren't being themselves, bro. And I'm saying that with glasses on, all right? I'm not even showing you who I am. I don't want to show people who I am underneath the glasses. I want to lead, lead a private life as well at the same time, even though you can see, as soon as I walk in the room with a hairstyle, you can see that it's me, but it doesn't matter. I would say that the phone, bro, has been the major reason why people are catastrophe in many, many ways, all right? And this is my reasoning. Listen here if you're going to cut that, all right? Khaki Tuda, whatever your name is. S Tuda. I don't know what your name is. But you can. there's nice blokes everywhere, all right? Now, do they look nice? Maybe not. You I mean, the guys say the same shit. The girls basically look like porn stars these days. When we go out, there's, there's left nothing to the imagination. There's a tick coming out. <clears throat> if she bends over to pick up the, you know, the dairy that fell on the floor, the box is basically there. To, you can sketch it, give it to a sketch artist in the police, you'd be able to see it straight away. It's outlined there. There's people walking around in fitness where it's just, you can see their organs inside. So for a bloke, that's very attractive. That's like, no. This thing's a machine, but you yeah, know what I mean? Like, why are, you sh- why are you that, you know, inconspicuous? So I would say, is it conspicuous? Inconspicuous? Inconspicuous, maybe. Whatever. I would say that that's part of the reason people want, want to have some mystery to them. You don't want to go on to... Here's another thing. You just say you meet a chick now. You've walked into a club. And this is Kaki I'm answering from the flip side from a bloke. You've walked into a club. You're having a dance. You're going, no, who are you, bro? Look at me, look at me, this, that. Balmain shirt on. You've taken out your life savings in cash. You're walking around with a Gucci man bag on. You look like you got a lot of money. You came with an Uber and you live with your parents, but it doesn't matter. You look good. And then you, you go up to a chick and you go, what's your name, babe? Who are you? Come a Sidisi, you know, can I take you out? Can I buy you a drink? This, that. Then what's going to happen? You're going to get their Snapchat. You're going to look at, you know, Svetlana, Svetlana from Carlton. She goes, look at, look at Svetlana Stodge. Look me up. I'm under Svetlana Stodge 03. You're going to look her up. She's 19 years old. And then you're going to find her Instagram. You're going to find out she's got 14,000 followers. And you've got 412. Most of them are your second cousins. You see she's got 14,000 followers. You stun, what the f- could she have 14,000 followers, bro? Is she Beyonce? And then you start looking down, uh, basically naked in every photo, laying on a bed. The bed, the bed's not made. The back of the, the thing, she's got some teddy bear that was given to her when she was five years old in the back of the thing. She's got makeup all over the shelves. It's got the strofa. There's 60 pairs of shoes in the corner that she's borrowed. 
And it's like, from a bloke, you're like, all a bloke's thinking about is how do I get on that bed? That's that's how it is. And then when the guy comes over there and he's like, no, drill you, drill you, this, that. The girl doesn't want that either because she's like, take me serious. Can you take me serious a little bit? And the guy's, yeah, but 14,000 followers, basically naked in every photo. What do you want me to expect? What do you expect? What do you want me to do? Same with the bloke. If a bloke's got his shirt out in every photo and sleeve tats everywhere and, and, you know, got cash out like Gucci Mane, what do you expect her to, to go, this resembles my dad who has a Jim's mowing service business and comes home with grass clippings every day all over his body and he, he hugs me and loves me and smells like petrol every day and this guy is unemployed, he looks like he's got more cash than Warren Buffet. There's a disconnect. Everything's weird in this world. It's all a pretend world. It's a pretend world. And I'm talking about the extremes here. There's other people that don't run their lives like that. But I'm saying there's a probably from the 16 years old to like 24, 26 years old, which is the, the time where most people get together. You don't get together much at 36. At 36, you're kind of old. You're off the market. You're old meat then. You know what I mean? You're, you're looking at 18-year-olds. They're looking at you like, oh, what's Mangal Dimche doing here? Shouldn't be in this place. Should be allowed here. You know, why, is, why isn't he, like, already in a nursing home? That's how they look at 36 years old. Trust me, when you were 18 years old, you look at 36-year-old, you're like, That's, that guy's a dinosaur. That's why I'll never step into a club ever again in my life. The only time I'll step into a club is if my daughter one day goes to me, there's some dickheads here, bro. I'm taking me, Dimche, you off to your chair, Blagoche in a fucking Ford Ranger, and we're going to that club. We're walking in. But it's like, otherwise, forget about it. The place is shit. So it's like the perception buckles people as well. Guys are looking at her and then looking. There's too much confidence in blokes and women. You've got to let vulnerability in, bro. Guys have to let a little bit of vulnerability. If you want to talk to a chick, you pull down your guards, bro. You relax. You're not speaking to the boys now. It's like show yourself who you are. And most of you are, you know, you're regular people sitting at home having baked beans on toast most of the time or some graft that your mum made last week. You just be that dude. They want to see vulnerability. And a chick, if, if they want to hold on to you. And for a chick, you also tone it down, bro. Pop a jumper on every now and then. And not a jumper that just covers your, your tits and leaves you all your vital organs open. Put it all the way down, past the belly button, fuck yeah. Simple as that. I know, oh, the fashion, this, the fact, this, trust me, they still make a, a full length jumper. Not all 50%. It's not all half battery life. You can go all the way down. It's as simple as that. And don't put a G-string backwards. Uh, let the guys come up with that. Let us peel off a little bit of the wrapping paper. You're taking it off and leaving it at home. It's just, it's open to see. There's no surprise element, bro. So that's, that's I, I don't know. Like, this is some of the feedback that I hear from the blokes. What else could it be? Tell me, what is it? Have human beings changed that much in the last 10, 15 years that no one's lovable anymore? No one's likable anymore? They are. People are likable. They're lovable. They're good people. There's a lot of good people, but it's like the, the wrapping paper is catastrophe. It's the, it's the profile. It's a profile, the image you're creating. I saw a girl giving a headjob to a banana on Instagram. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to say to that? Oh, Vlad, you, you're judging people. No. She was deep throating a banana. A Cavendish banana was getting the best blowjob of all time. And she's by herself in a car and some her girlfriend is cheering her on. Yeah, you go and go, you go and go. She's like, but, but, what? What's happening? Please, wake up to yourself, all right? I've said a million times, bro. The reason this, the loveless generation is going to happen is because they're the extremes, by the way. So you want to gun it to the middle. Gun it to the middle. Don't do that dumb shit. And you're going you're gonna to attract the bloke that's, doesn't do that dumb shit too. And then he's going to come to you. You attract what you are. You really do, bro. That's, that's as best as advice. If you're out here and you're going, I can't track the good bloke, you be as good of a girl as you can, the good bloke will come to you. And if doth he then come to you, you just politely reject and keep searching forward. Keep your standards to a reasonable level. Again, you can't go to the level where only Jesus Christ can be your partner because you're not that perfect. You need to be able to... Sometimes you'll find some guy that's a bit catastrophic and you go, I'll fix this bloke. Women have got a great way of fixing it. My missus is far better of a person than I am. And due to that, she's helped me bring some balance into my life. If it wasn't for the missus, I'd be strayed from the path many, many times over, bro. It's like 
because she was so much better of a person that she she like her judgment and her her love and care for me as well but also her judgment kept me from from just deviating down into shit so it was like and many times i was like fall off the path and she'd like oh what are you doing and this and that and come over here and the fear of losing someone that loves you it's another thing so it keeps you together so there's another tip bro like if you find blokes are nowhere find one that's not that nowhere and that you like and love and all of that and help each other come back to the middle that whole social media thing i think it's relevant bro um I don't want to be the type of guy out here sounding like some freak that doesn't understand. I do understand I'm in that world. I've got the perception of a lone wolf, bro. I'm not saying anything that doesn't happen. That's for sure happening, bro, all the time. And it definitely contributes. It definitely contributes. Think about the 90s and the 2000s when we were here. No social media, bro. Every girl you meet is a mystery. Every girl you meet, you'll want to kind of find out about. It's part of the reason why guys pursue it. You pursue something you don't know about, all right? If you know everything, you've seen that movie. It's done. And, and of course, if a girl's a little machine and you've seen all the movie, what's a guy want to do? What? You, look, if you pump up your lips and your lips are coming out looking like two rubber balloons, do you think we want to hear a story come out of your mouth? You know what you're doing, bro. You know what you're doing. It's all a, it's all a sexual thing. And blokes get very attracted to that sexual thing. But do they want to pursue and stay, prolong... Because as soon as the sexual thing's going out and the whinging starts on a Sunday avo, it's then like very easy to resort going back to Dimche. So it's like, I don't know, like this is my opinion, bro. Take care of your world, don't care. Uh, that's what I would say. If, more if you resort to a, a, a less revealing lifestyle on the socials, um, you'll attract a better caliber of person by you becoming a better caliber of person. It is a mirror, bro. The world's a mirror. You attract what you are, for sure. Um, and if you say, no, nah, I'm not like that, but I keep attracting it. One of my mates, I'm not going to mention his name, continuously getting into fights, continuously getting into fights his whole life. His, his excuse to me is every time I'll be like, hey, bro, what's going on with you, man? Every time I go to a bar or I hear they've gone to bar, get your head punched in or you punch someone else's head in. He goes, I don't know what it is, bro, but trouble follows me. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't follow you. You create it, bro. I know you, you don't have to look at that moron on the other side of the room that's looking at you. He's just as bad as you. And you're both just basically gay for each other. You, you should just go and pound each other in the car park instead of worrying about if fighting each other next to a pool table. Just go and make love because you're probably both gay anyway. You could be if you're going to cut that. So, I mean, I'm allowing everyone to be what they are. Love is love, bro. So don't have a go at me. I'm just giving options over here. More peace. Okay, so instead of looking at someone and going, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Uh, like two dogs in the street and going to fight for no real reason, which is I've witnessed that literally in a pool room for no reason. I think he's, he, he bumped him on the back and that was enough for pool cues to be snapped over each other's heads and security guards coming in like it was someone streaking at the cricket ground. It's dumb shit, right? He created that always creating that situation he could walk off he could go boys there's some morons in the corner do you reckon we can bounce man walk off walk quickly get out of there bro it's simple as that oh you're a pussy no you're not a pussy bro you're a smart bloke why do you need to have your head caved in right now for what so it's like you're you're attracting he was attracting and i was looking at my other, his other mates and i was like you guys are similar birds of a feather, feather flock together kind of thing and then i was looking at my mates a bunch of kind of dorks that weren't into that world so much and that wasn't occurring to them. So this is a fucking big question, bro. Kaki, whatever your name was, Kaki the what? Kaki Esda, whatever. Thanks very much, bro. I hope you find the man of your dream. You will just keep a, keep that attitude positive and be the best version. The best bloke will come 100%. Don't let the dream die. All right, yeah, here we go. Last one, bro. Got to go rap. Funniest comedian or famous person you've met? There's a couple of funny people, bro. Crook John Shank from Sydney is very funny. Um, I've met Sebastian Maniscalco. He's very funny. 
Uh, I've met at the Perth Comedy Festival, hung out with some comedians uh, that are very funny. There's a weird thing with comics, bro. Like sometimes that could be down to earth, very down to earth and all of that. And then some of them are on the spectrum and you can't talk to them and they're like manic before shows. And, and I'm manic. Like yeah, it, It's like you're, you're about to perform. It's hard. And then most of them just get on the turps afterwards and drink and stuff. But you, there's some definitely some very funny people that I've met. But everyone knows, bro, in your own group, there's always funny people. My group of friends, I was grow, I was been raised by a very funny dad like my dad's one of the funniest people i've ever met in my life he's not like funny to say hey bro can you can you start telling jokes and stuff like that he's the least funniest person like that the least funniest if you were to say to him can you tell me some you know tell us a couple of jokes you'll be like uh he takes too long he doesn't really have many like points of view uh like if he's trying to tell a joke he's the worst at it he does it verbatim but when he's telling you his just personal experiences of what's happened he's hilarious the bloke's one of the funniest but all my mates dimche yofche borche blagoche uh, hilarious people bro and I don't know, like some of the stories that I've heard from these blokes have been very, very funny. One of my mates, I remember back in the day, he was like a, a heavy wog. Let's just call him a tunnel wog. Very, very heavy wog. And <sighs> I still remember, bro, this is one of the funniest things I've ever heard from him. He, I got this bloke into bodyboarding. He, he wanted to bodyboard and we were bodyboarding a lot back then. We were like 20 years old, 20, 22, 23. He was a little bit younger, maybe like two years younger than us, but he wanted to bodyboard. But like, I'm talking about proper head, like thick eyebrows, tanned beyond belief, proper head, uh, thick accent, what do you want, who you going, bro? Like, very heavy like that and we we're out surfing at Cronulla and I remember one day I met this bloke like I got on me at 6 30 in the morning at the point we're gonna go catch some waves and he's like yeah 100 percent yeah bro I can't wait you know and I was like yeah let's let's do it and then he was like all right so he meets me there and um he turns up at 6 30 maybe like 6 40 it was a little bit later than what I turned up and this guy reeking on durries like it's it's a fresh morning he turns up like 20 years old reeking on durries and i was like fuck bro what's going on bro what are you doing he goes oh, man, what's wrong with you what's wrong with you and i go no what you stink bro you're like an ashtray he goes oh I've pumped a few durries i go what are you talking about a few it's like you live in rockdale what how long did it take you to get here he goes there's a bit of traffic bro 20 25 minutes I go, how many durries did you pump? He goes, uh, three. I've pumped three durries. <laughs> I was like, why? And he goes, why not? I go, what, just just play? Like, I'm inquisitive, so I'm just very curious asking. I go, when did you have the first one? He goes, I punched the first one outside on the toilet. I go, where? He goes, I've got an old shit box at the backyard. I get up in the morning. I walk straight outside. The durry packet sitting on the window sill outside that he shares a durry packet with his dad. It's like an outdoor durry packet. You keep it there and, and that's where you go outside and they're both like, his dad just buys it, but they both contribute taking them. Now this guy gets it, six o'clock in the morning, call it, walks out, puts the durry in their mouth, walks out to the toilet, Drops the Grogan. Drops the last night's burrito and the graf off. Oh, the Corbus here coming out very quickly after the diary because it, it's a stimulant at the same time gets the guts cranking. And I remember just him just saying that to me and I was going to myself, Jesus Christ, bro. Like, And then when was the second one? He goes, the second one, as soon as I jumped in the car, cranked the windows up, rolled the windows open. He had an old Suzuki Swift, rolled the windows open, smashing the durry. Between Rockdale to say San Susie, he smashed the durry. Once he's flicked that out the window to the opposing traffic, he's gone. As soon as there's a set of lights, what's he going to do? This is like before the iPhones, this is before all of that stuff. Smash another durry while listening to Triple M, Mick Malloy. He'd be punching another durry. Anyway, I go out there. The waves were pretty big that day. And I remember going to him, calm down, you don't know what you're doing very much. You know, 
So he didn't want to tell me everything, but when we finished surfing, we went to get a portos and we sat down on the like on the grass hill and I go to him, why did you like why were you late this morning or something like that? He goes, but bro, last night, yeah, I know, this was a Monday morning. I went out to this club, bro. I go, really? Last night? He goes, I got I didn't get home till five in the morning. I haven't slept. I go, Are you serious, bro? He goes, No, no, I haven't slept. And I go, Oh, I thought you were like you're fresh. Like he goes, Nah, man, I'm hung over. That's why I had the Red Bull. That's why I've had the durries. I'm I'm gone. And I go, Where did you go last night? He goes, Bro, I went out to this club where old bats go. And I go, What's that? <laughs> He goes, old Tetki go there, like older ladies, divorcees, things like that, girls in their 30s, 40s, 50s, old ducks that, that are back on the market. And I go, but you're 20. You're a soccer player for Rockdale Linden. What, what are you doing there? He goes, bro, you know how easy it is to pick up these girls. I go, right. So this is funny to me. So I'm listening to these stories and it's, it's wild. There's something I wouldn't do. Even though we were like similar age, I wouldn't go hunting in those, in those ponds. You know what I mean? I'll be like, well, why? It's cheating. But he, he loved it. And he goes, yeah. He goes, got lucky last night. I go, are you serious? He goes, yeah, bro, this mum, bro, like a milf. And I go, right. He goes, little Greek machine, bro. And I was like, wow, what what happened? He goes, oh, party, I ended up at her house, bro. I go, are you serious? I go, did you go left? He goes, yeah, of course I went left, bro. Of course I did. And I was like, on the first night, that's pretty pretty good success. He goes, she was, she was loving me, bro. You wouldn't believe it as well, bro. You know what I mean? I hit the back door as well. I was like, what? He goes, bro, anal. I was like, you're not. You're kidding me, bro. You're kidding. This doesn't happen. This is a porno thing. He goes, no, porno, bro. She loves me, bro. She loves me. And then he goes, yeah, anyway, I might see you next week. I go, no, 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 hold on for a second, bro. What do you mean, anal? How does that, how, how do you even get to that point? It's three in the morning, you're both drunk, like, how is that, you know, change of gears happening? And he goes, easy, bro. I go, what do you mean, easy? He goes, well, I just asked her, bro. What? I go, how? He goes, I just stop, pulls out, and I go to her, let me throw it in your ass, bro. Yeah.